it's exciting. Does it, does it start with a live demonstration between the uh, Depends how, how positive your introduction is. First, I need a volunteer from the audience. Yes. So I was thinking that was pretty nice. Do you just stand here a little bit? Yes. It's very pleasant thing that you don't do. I feel like. Yes, Manu. Warcraft, I remember it. It's my childhood right there. Sexuality, that's what Gray talks about, the biology of that, for example. This talk will be a little different. Mr. Curley, in his thesis, was not so much interested in what bio biologically determines a man, but whether or not on that natural foundation there's some virtue that's properly masculine. Does it mean something to be a man? insofar as you're a man, to be a good man, as opposed to being a good woman. So this is a question we're all concerned about. All of you are either a man or no man. <laughs> <laughs> so if there is such a thing as a, as a properly masculine virtue, it's something we need to worry about, and it's something we may be able to develop. So. Please help me welcome Mr. Matthew Curley. Hello. Welcome to Manly in this 101. Today we're going to learn how to throw a punch. <laughs> I'd like to begin by thanking Dr. Olson for being my thesis advisor and walking with me throughout this process and Dr. Beats and your comments on my thesis and helping me formulate how to move forward in coming up with my oration were very, very helpful. And Dr. Grove, I ordered some cigars to bribe you with, but unfortunately they're not going to be here until Monday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it depends on how the Q&A goes. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> I need to know what kind of scars you were. <laughs> I'm going to withhold that information. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so I'd like to begin with the prayer. Uh, but before we do, I need to ask um, Is there anyone here named Matilda? Good. <laughs> All right, let's start with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. So I guess there's no version of me taking up the question of what it means to be a good man without at least mentioning my father in passing. Um, two days ago, I called my dad on the phone, and the first thing he said to me was, um, just so you know, I'm in the car, we might get disconnected. Your mom's driving me to the doctor. Uh, he had heart surgery fairly recently, and so he's not driving. And the, and the, the comment stuck with me. And I noted, noted it because 
I've been alive for about 26 years, and there's only one time I can remember in my entire life that I ever saw my mom drive my dad, and it was about a three-minute drive tops. <laughs> and so, naturally, as a as a young child, I drew the conclusion of always seeing my dad driving my mom. I drew the conclusion that, okay, well, I guess that's just the way it is. The man drives the woman. Like, that's that's what that's what how it works with the real man. Well, and then that moment happened, and I had enough insight to realize, okay, maybe that's not the defining factor. <laughs> <laughs> but we do that a lot. There's all these things, these preconce preconceived notions that we have that when we start thinking about the question seriously, we have to challenge. For instance, I've heard people say, and sometimes I have a tendency to think, well, a real man drinks black coffee and whiskey, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> but then every now and then I'm sitting in crux and Dr. Papadopoulos comes in and orders a dirty chai. <laughs> okay, well, maybe that's not the defining factor of a real man either. <laughs> That could have gone another way. <laughs> um, if I can give one more example, my dad is about two years older than my mother, and so I figured, okay, well, that seems about right. You know, the man should be about two years older than his wife. And I'm really hoping that that one is wrong because I'm engaged to a woman who is exactly one year, one month, one week and one day older than I am. <laughs> so we'll hold out and figure that out later. <laughs> so we have a tendency to think of what it means to be a good man on a somewhat superficial level. And then when we start to realize that, well, that's just silly in a lot of ways, we turn to something deeper. And for something deeper, I would like to turn to Winston Churchill. This is the first quote on your quote sheet. He says, A man does what he must, in spite of personal consequences, in spite of obstacles and dangers and pressures. And that is the basis of all human morality. Now, when I first read this quote, I almost cried because it sort of revolutionized the way that I thought about the question of what it means to be a good man. And I realized that perhaps the greatest man that I've ever known was my mother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to assume that you caught the sarcasm based on the doctor. <laughs> but okay, it's right there in the quote. He says, and that is the basis of all human morality. So clearly, it's not just these deeper, more profound things of duty and obligation the good man must be a man. That seems to be fairly straightforward. And so where where we begin is examining or contemplating the natural differences between men and women. We have men, we have women, obviously they're both human, but they are different. And so if we're going to talk about what it means to be a good man, and if we are going to try to find some sort of virtue which characterizes the proper conduct of a good man, well then, that virtue must primarily deal with the differences that are specific to men, the qualities and characteristics that are naturally masculine. And, and, and that's an interesting word, masculine, because I, I ran into a lot of trouble when I was doing research for my thesis when I was looking into masculinity, because you have some people who treat the word masculine as purely biological traits of men, and then you have other people, well, there's, okay, there's the phrase toxic masculinity. And, okay, so the word masculinity is derived from the Latin word mas, which simply means male. So on a very technical, etymological level, the word masculine just refers to things like beards, baldness, um, <laughs> bone density, higher bone density, uh, muscle mass, aggression, the drive to compete, things like that. Those are all masculine traits on a on an etymological level. 
And so you have to think, okay, well, in some ways, toxic masculinity doesn't really make sense as a phrase if you understand masculinity in that way. Because, I don't know, maybe if you put a lot of product in your beard and then you cut it off and eat it, it's not going to sit well with your digestive tract. <laughs> but I don't think that's really what we're getting at when we say toxic masculinity. <laughs> <laughs> similarly, if baldness can be toxic, then I should stop shampooing my hair because I grow in toxicity every time I take a shower. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have you have masculinity in that sense on one side. But then on the other side, we do have to take the idea of toxic masculinity seriously because by putting toxic in front of the word masculinity, we're anticipating this idea that there are certain aspects, there are certain natural masculine traits that can be abused, aggression for instance, and that's the basic for toxicity. And so it seems like even in secular society, we can recognize that there are certain things rooted in nature, but there are expectations that go along with that. So we know that we should expect something from men, but we don't necessarily know what that is. And today I'd like to delve into that question and determine what is the virtue that characterizes the proper code of conduct of the good man? And then towards the end, I'd like to take up the topic of boxing, and I'm going to argue that boxing is one method of training in that in that virtue, which I'm going to I'm going to call manliness. So throughout my oration, I'm going to refer to masculinity in a purely etymological sense. So if I refer to something as being masculine, I'm referring to a biological trait. Whereas if I say manliness, by manliness, I mean the virtue which characterizes the conduct that is proper to the good man. So how do we act in regards to our nature? Aristotle said that nature does nothing in vain. Nature is purposive. purposive. <clears throat> and for this, let's turn to the quote sheet, quote number two. It says, nature, as we declare, does nothing without purpose. And then quote three, action for an end is present in things which come to be and are by nature. And so... Basically, to summarize and paraphrase what Aristotle says about nature, we can think of nature as an internal principle that guides us towards fulfilling our end instead of leaving it up to chance. If people didn't get hungry and didn't have that natural instinct to eat, then you're kind of leaving it up to chance. Like Some people might happen to eat something, and then they're going to survive. And if they're relatively intelligent, they might pick up on the pattern, oh, the people who are doing this thing are surviving, so we're going to do that. But then anyone who just by chance doesn't happen to eat when they see a burger and they're starting to feel weak, well, they're going to they're gonna perish out. And that might be good. You're getting rid of the dumb ones. <laughs> <laughs> but, but nature doesn't want to leave this to chance. Nature is here for the purpose of helping us survive and helping us to thrive. And so Aristotle would say that we must act in accordance with nature rather than <clears throat> turning away from nature and making arbitrary choices. And so if we're thinking about what the good man does in relation to his natural masculine <clears throat> qualities, well, we know he doesn't repress them. If he re represses his natural masculine traits, then he's acting contrary to nature and is hindering his ability to fulfill his end as, as a man. And I'm going to refer to the repression of these natural male traits as emasculation, which is literally just, well, you have masculinity and then emasculation is not that. <laughs> so on one extreme, we have the total repression of natural masculine traits. 
But then another extreme would be developing those natural traits, but overindulging in them and never showing any sort of restraint in regards to them. In the political regime, this would look something like the tyrant who uses any possible advantage or power he has to serve his own purposes and take advantage of those who are under his authority or, or under his power. And then in the, in the domestic regime, this would look like the husband who's always beating on his wife and children. And I'm, and I'm going to refer to this, this overindulgence in, in masculine inclinations or traits as fruitishness, like B U R. Yeah, B U R U T E, brute, brutishness. It's hard to say sometimes. So. so, on the one extreme, we have emasculation, which goes against nature. And on the other, on the other hand, we have the extreme of brutishness, which is an overindulgence and unrestrained action in regards to those masculine traits. Now, Aristotle would say that the virtue lies at the mean between the two extremes. And so we can tentatively give a definition of manliness as the cultivation and development of natural masculine traits in a way that they are moderate and self-restrained. So there you have the two. First of all, you have the virtue, which is dealing specifically with the masculine traits. And we know, okay, according to nature, I'm supposed to cultivate and develop this trait, but it's all supposed to be moderated. We don't want to get out of control. And somewhere in there, we find the mean. Now, I like this definition, but it comes with a couple, with a couple practical problems, just in terms of well, how do we live out this virtue? And that's, it's, it's not always easy to be honest with yourself. And so you can, you can repress your nature under the guise of just being self-restrained. And this would be something like, oh, you, you're really charitable. You turn to the other cheek. Well, did you turn the other cheek or are you just a coward? Because there's a very big difference. Similarly, you can over, overindulge in something natural under the guise of just trying to cultivate and moderate it. And so I want to refine our definition of manliness to include the concept of the common good, which helps us to act prudently. If, if, we're, if in some way we're acting contrary to our nature, then that's harmful, at least to us, if not to others. And so clear, clearly that doesn't serve the common good because it's harmful to you. Similarly, if you are unrestrained and tyrannical in your action, then you're harming others. And so clearly harming others is contrary to the common good. And so if we ask ourselves, what do I do in this situation in order to serve the common good? Then we have a little bit more assurance than the action we're doing is actually actually in the mean. We know we're not repressing nature and we're not overindulging our nature because, well, it's serving the common good. Now, just to make this a little more practical, we're going to take up the idea of boxing because theoretical philosophical ideas are really helpful they're good but when it comes to asking the question what does it mean to be a good man we have to get a little more <laughs> practical how do you how do you train yourself if you're a man how do you train yourself to be a good man and if you have if you have sons or men or boys in your life that you have care over how do you train them to be a good man now, the thing about boxing, is that boxing deals explicitly with 
with the masculine quality of aggression. And I'm not trying to make an argument that aggression is the most central or the most important or the defining factor of manliness. I'm singling out aggression because we kind of have this statistical problem when it comes to defining masculine traits. Because, all right, let's take the example of a beard. So if someone were to come up to me and they tell me something about a person, and the only thing I know about this person is they have a beard. You're not guaranteed to be right, but it's a much safer guess to guess that the person they're talking about is a man, because most beards are men. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that all beards are men. There are some women who have beards. Yes, I'm looking at you, Matilda. <laughs> but generally, it's a safe assumption. If someone has a beard, you can assume that they're a man. Most of the time, historically, you would be right. Maybe that statistic is getting thrown off a little bit. Easily, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make up the statistic. Say 99% of people with beards are men, and 1% of them. Still probably way off, but that's the best I can do. Okay, so clearly I think we can define that as a masculine trait. What if it's something that 95% of men have, but 5% is women? Okay, I think that's still probably a masculine trait. But what, what about when you get down to 80% and 20%? At some point it's just going to be chance if it's 51% men and 49% women, then that looks a lot more like chance than just, than something you could argue is a natural biological trait. And so the reason I am singling out aggression is, well, there, there's two main reasons. The first reason is because the improper use of aggression has much more serious consequences than, say, I don't really know how you would misuse having a beard. Maybe it's really long and you go around strangling people with it. <laughs> <laughs> but that seems a little absurd. So, but with something like aggression, if you're overly aggressive, then you're probably harming someone else in some way. And if you lack aggression, then there's a big chance of you being harmed by someone else. And so that's one reason I'm choosing aggression. But the other reason, and this goes back to the statistic question, is of all the different traits between men and women that sort of have this practical application of obvious proper use or misuse, the use of strength and aggression seems to be one of the most widely accepted. And I don't want to have to go into all of the science and biological statistics and all this stuff to convince you that it's actually a masculine trait. So I'm just trying to take one that I think is fairly widely accepted as men tend to be more, more aggressive and stronger than women. And so looking at aggression as a natural masculine trait, and then thinking of myself in the future, if I have a son who's kind of a masculine, he can't stand up for himself, he gets bullied at school, he has no power of assertion or autonomy, he can't show any sort of aggression in any circumstances, well, what do I do? How do I help him become a better man? Well, the way I would choose to do it is I would teach him how to box. Because boxing requires a combination of aggression and control. And so with my, my son, who seems rather emasculated, I put him in the boxing ring. Well, he's required to reach down somewhere inside and find that aggression and be able to express it. But as he learns how to cultivate and develop his aggression, 
he's simultaneously learning how to control it because boxing has these these rules and regulations in place so that you can't just be totally unrestrained. You have to operate within the rules of the game. Similarly, if my son is brutish and he is the bully, he can't control himself, he can't control his temper, he's immoderate and irrestrained, particularly in regards to aggression, well, I'm going to teach him how to box. Because the thing about aggression is... Aggression and competitiveness are, are very much linked. And so, so let's say I have a super aggressive son. He's very competitive. He just wants to win. Well, the thing about boxing is it has these rules and regulations. And if you don't play by the rules, you can't win. And so in order for him to win and ultimately satisfy his competitiveness and his aggression, he has to learn how to control it. Because otherwise, he's going to throw low blows. He's going to push below the belt to the back of the head. He's not going to listen to the ref. He's go either going to lose enough points that he just loses the contest, or he might just be disqualified for bad sportsmanship. And so in both cases, whatever extreme my, my son happens to be on, if I teach him how to box, it will teach him how to how to moderate and restrain while also cultivate and develop his aggression to the proper degree. So here's my question. <coughs> Boxing seems to satisfy the original definition of manliness that I gave, which deals with the natural masculine traits and developing and moderating them. But what about the common good? It seems like maybe a team sport would be a lot more effective in instilling the sense of serving the common good in, in anyone. And that's true. And ideally, my son would be in, in boxing and a team sport. That would be great. But remember, we're dealing specifically with with the virtue that deals with, with men and traits and characteristics that are specific to men. Acting in service of the common good, while it's very important for men, it's not exclusive to men. And so while it's something that we need to teach young men to be aware of, and in some ways it brings everything it brings the rest of the virtue together and gives it a focal point. Ultimately, because boxing explicitly deals with a natural male trait, aggression, boxing is a more effective way to teach the virtue of manliness, which, again, the common good is very important to the definition, but the very foundation of the virtue has to deal specifically with the masculine traits and inclinations. Okay, so here's the moment of truth. To summarize what we've said so far, we've established that nature acts for an end. It enables us to reach and fulfill our end. It gives us the means and the ability to reach our end. <clears throat> and so we have to act in accordance with nature, but we also have to be moderate and restrained. And in, in, in order for us to help decide if we're actually acting within the mean, we look towards this higher idea of the common good. And I also argued that Boxing is an effective way to, to cultivate that virtue in men. Here's the catch. My oration is titled, entitled, or subtitled, How to Throw a Punch. And I don't want that to be a clickbait title. I don't, that's one of my biggest pet peeves is when someone advertises something in their oration, 
And you can tell by looking at it, they're not actually going to do that. <laughs> Someone asked me the other day if I was going to bring a punching bag in to demonstrate how to throw a punch. And my only comment on that is, I'm just praying that when we get to the Q&A, it doesn't look like I am the punching bag. <laughs> <laughs> and so I could teach you how to throw a punch. I could teach the technique that's needed to throw a good, solid, forceful punch. But I feel like that would be more appropriate to an oration that deals with the biology of man in, on a more physical, technical level. Whereas I'm dealing with what does it mean to be a good man? And so when I say how to throw a punch, I'm talking about how to throw a good punch in the sense of when, where, and how would the good man throw a punch? And the answer to that is rooted in our our definition of, of manliness, which is ultimately you throw the punch at the right time to the right degree as hard and as often as is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gurley. Um, you anchor your presentation, as you should, on the concept of nature. Uh, we live in a society which can be characterized almost entirely by the phrase rejection of nature right now. So how do you convince the people out there that what you're saying is worth listening to? <coughs> They've replaced nature with a construct, an artificial construct. Honestly, I don't know. It was enough for me to realize, well, on an intuitive level, it just made sense to me that we should be acting in accordance with our nature. Mm -hmm. And then on an intellectual level, it made sense to me that thinking of nature as something that serves a purpose and doesn't leave doesn't leave it up to chance, at least not mostly up to chance. Another characteristic of society today, which is really paradoxical and perverse, because society in its downward slide began by rejecting religion and philosophy in this alleged embrace of science. It's now rejecting science as well. Um, do you think that perhaps the answer to that first question would be to return to science and recognize something in our animality? Uh, that would be the, give you the support. In other words, turn back to our evolutionary origins, if you will, to see what nature, how nature could be defined and justified. I think so. Like, I mean, if you, I mean, think of Descartes, and, like, if you over-intellectualize things and don't base your sense of reality in some way on, on your sense of perception of reality, then it becomes very easy to, it's very easy to convince yourself of something in your mind in a very arbitrary way that's not, mm -hmm. not based in, in reality. So would it be uh, plausible to say that men should be aggressive because male gorillas and male salamanders are aggressive? Interesting. I'm assuming male salamanders are aggressive. <laughs> I've only talked to female salamanders. <laughs> I think I'm the wrong, the wrong person to answer this question in the way that I'm going to answer it, but my initial inclination would be to answer saying, it seems like it would be better to look at 
the science of humans first and see what what we can learn from human biology and in historically what we can learn from men and then we turn to other animals to see if because i think i think seeing aggressive male gorillas would support the claim that human males would also be more aggressive but i don't think it's enough because there's some species where the where it's the female who tends to be more aggressive presumably like the praying mantis or black widow yeah. <laughs> Thank you. This is totally. Um, so obviously, for the WCC, one of the things that we do here, um, many of the things that we do here emphasize <coughs> what we might call the virtue of fortitude, where we overcome physically difficult things. And so in boxing, that seems like that's a clear element. Um, and then there's an aggression puts you in a situation, I mean, aggression often puts you in situations where you're going to have to endure pain if uh, the aggression is returned. Um, but of course, there are other elements to it as well. Could you, what, what would your assessment be of, say, boxing specifically, um, in terms of how it breaks down, in terms of what what is the, I've just got to deal with pain and get back up and you know keep my punches? Um, how, how much of it is that, that virtue of fortitude and how does that play out? Um, and what other good things do you see? Um, what spiritual or psychological uh, virtues are present in boxing or in other ways of acting out aggression that men should develop to an appropriate degree? The first two obvious things that come to mind would be in terms of other good things that boxing teaches to use discipline, you have to be disciplined and make sure you're training yourself. I mean, it's also a really good workout. The other thing, though, is specifically in terms of fortitude, is this is another way where you can learn moderation, not in terms of aggression. Aquinas talks about, let's see if I can remember his terminology, but there's there's fortitude, but then, so that's the virtue that lies between the two extremes. And on one extreme, you have I haven't read this since August, but basically, you have imprudently pursuing and persevering to an extent that you're not capable of, and then you have just immediately falling down and cowering against like just the smallest bit of pain and so pretty uh boxing deals with that and like well if you get a little love tap to the face from a playful opponent and you decide to quit because you're afraid of getting hurt then obviously you're on one extreme but if you're getting just totally destroyed and beat up and you're bleeding from everywhere and you keep getting knocked down then it would be imprudent to continue and so so boxing can teach you fortitude. And you also have accountability because you have you have your coach who has the power to throw in the towel and stop the fight if he thinks that you're you're continuing beyond your means. And so you have a little bit you can try to make the decision yourself, but ultimately you have your coach who has the final say and he can make that decision. So what beyond Fortitude is there is there in the fact that you are in the con in, in boxing or in other forms of aggression you are in some sense directly pitting yourself against a human opponent. You know, some human is now in the position of opponent who may be best friends outside the ring, but at the moment you're attempting to knock that person down, um, and that's something that you know on a on a hiking trip attempting to you know summit yeah peak or something. You know, there is no human opponent that I'm attempting to be better of. Is there, I mean, can that obviously, it seems fairly obvious that that could be abused and that could become part of a toxic masculinity sort of, you know, an abuse of masculinity. Um, what is it good for? What, what spiritual or psychological value does that have? Well, on the one hand, you have 
you have to fight up with nature, you always have to have a certain reverence and humility with it. Because ultimately, if you're on a boat in the middle of the ocean, you can work with nature, but you can't really conquer nature in the same way that you can conquer a human opponent in the ring. And, and I'm not saying this is a bad thing, that's a good thing, because these feats that we attempt against nature, like I guess cooperating with nature, can teach us humility and also fortitude and perseverance. And that and that comes with a certain amount of confidence. But there's something there's something about stepping in the ring and knowing that you're about to go to war for a few minutes with another human being and sometimes you don't really know how good of a chance you stand against another person. There's something mysterious and exhilarating about that. And it's humbling in a way. You you are sort of placing your your skill and your aggression on the line. But ultimately you're testing you're testing yourself out against another person. There's like the scriptural idea of iron sharpening iron. And I've often heard that used as the way in which it takes men to make other men. And so it's sort of you have two people who are on the same journey towards towards this idea of manliness, assuming that they step in the ring with that idea and they're not only stepping in the ring in order to cause harm to the other person. Um, does that answer the question a little bit? It seems like um, women have to be aggressive too, um, and moderate in their aggression, right? Um, women need to assert themselves. Um, and not over assert themselves, just as men do. They need to defend themselves. So, so, can you say a little bit more about why, or what's the connection between aggression and mass and manliness? It is absolutely necessary that women have aggression to a moderate degree. That's true. But the reason that that is qualified as a masculine trait instead of a general human trait is because primarily due to testosterone, men tend to be much more aggressive than women. And so nature has given men sort of the a moderate amount of aggression for a man on a natural level looks different than a moderate amount of aggression for a woman. And I think that's because, well, aggression and strength go together because if you're really, really strong but have no aggression, then your strength is kind of useless because what are you going to do in a fight? I don't know. And similarly, if you're super, super aggressive, but have no natural ability to do anything with your aggression, then it's then aggression also becomes sort of a useless trait. And so, so that the, the the fact that men are given given strength and aggression that to a greater degree than women doesn't deny that women also need to be moderate in regards to aggression. It just means that the moderate level for a woman isn't necessarily the same as it would be for a man. Um, is there, can you give me something besides aggression that connects with manliness? Okay, so here's an interesting one that I, I mentioned briefly in my thesis was, okay, so men have this, this enzyme which breaks down alcohol before it reaches your bloodstream, and they have a much higher level of that enzyme than women. And that's why men tend to be able to drink much more than women. And so it's like, okay, well, I mean, that kind of supports the claim that, okay, well, drink, maybe drinking whiskey is something. 
I kind of like that idea. <laughs> but if you look at that, okay, so men have this natural ability to drink more alcohol than women. So then you ask, okay, well, what's the purpose of that ability? So one extreme would be you don't use it for anything. You just drink as much as you can and you black out. So like you're not really making any use of the trait, so that would be so that would be emasculation. And then the other extreme would be maybe you go to a bar with a woman and you drink the same amount as her, but now she's tipsy and isn't thinking clearly, but you still have your wits around you, and now that could cause a problem. And so so my argument is the, the proper use of that trait in order to make it manly would be, okay, you go to a bar with a woman, you're able to drink the same amount as her, but you're still perfectly fine. You're able to protect her and take care of her. You, you still have your wits about you so that you're not tempted to take advantage of her or anything like that. And uh, that's the first one that came to mind because I, I brought it up in my thesis. Um, I can try to come up with another one. I might like another one. That seems that seems like either it's a strange accident or there's some reason why men would be able to drink more than women. And if it if there's a reason, it doesn't seem like so you can go to bars and drink more. You know. Any thoughts on why that why is there an advantage? Is there some there's some reason why it's good for man to be able to drink more. Any answer I could give on that would be speculation. I think I have to sit. With okay. Yes, that's, that's fair. Maybe what about what fair. about something else? <laughs> so whatever one everyone's terrified, you're gonna say something like, "Oh yeah, men are smarter." They should. They should. Uh, that's part, that's part of manliness. But I'm trying to I'm trying to bait you a little bit. I, want, I was hoping you would just take a little risk. Aggression seems kind of easy. Is there something else? Some other virtue that's properly part of manliness as as distinct. Is there going to be any part of this that that uh, a man needs to cultivate that a woman doesn't need to cultivate? Or will it always be something like aggression, where a man will just need to the moderate? Man will look different than the moderate woman. See, I think. Okay, so right after this, Anna Klein's going to do her thesis, and she goes a lot more in depth <coughs> about the psychological differences between men and women. And again, I'm not an expert on, I didn't really delve into the psychological differences, but there is a way in which like the male brain and the female brain function very differently but it's in a way that they're both they're both using different means well i also don't know if i'm allowed to explore what she's going to say to her, so maybe I'll just... <laughs> i think i think primarily because because ultimately most of the differences between men and women on a biological level are are caused by or initiated by much higher levels of testosterone but women still have a significant amount of testosterone just a much lower level i can't think of any one trait that is like this is something that's a trait that's only going to be present in men and therefore should only be cultivated in men and it's some sort of fluke of nature that needs to be totally ignored if for some reason it happens to show up in a woman. Because ultimately I mean we share the same human nature and then there's a lot of accidental differences in our matter. But I think I would have to be a lot more well-versed in biology to be able to give a definitive answer about, about exactly which, which folks are. Just we'll take questions from the audience. Can I try one? Sure. Um, just briefly, 
Actually, uh, Mr. Gurley, I, I think you're just you're allowing yourself to be a little too focused on aggression, and and uh, you would have gone a long ways towards an answer to Dr. Olson just by you know relaxing a little bit, realizing what what's the necessary concomitant of aggression. It's just all of the physical development, all of the physical strength, the musculature, and all that, governed as you suggest by testosterone, but ordered not merely to fighting, but to providing, protecting making a way in the world, that sort of thing. And as a close uh, <clears throat> accompaniment to that, um, and I hope Ms. Klein gets into this a bit, uh, <laughs> I'll just say it. Uh, it's been theorized a, a fair amount lately that um, in domestic terms, we can see that the woman's mind is more intuitive and the man's is more discursive. And that's a beautiful complementary. You were suggesting you were hinting at complementary. So that's an area to be explored further. I, I want to ask one last question. Um, the charge has been made every once in a while down through the ages, but very emphatically beginning with Nietzsche, that Christianity is a feminizing or emasculating uh, affair. Do you have any comment, grief, to address uh, to that point? I not speak good language, English. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the big thing is because there's plenty of Bible verses about you know ideas of turning the other cheek and that sort of thing. And it's very, very clear that there is an appropriate time to turn the other cheek. But then you also see Christ driving mm. people out of the temple. And but the thing is, well, first of all, we know that it wasn't just He's never getting better than his own. Like, mm -hmm. That's just like he's a perfect man. But I think it's also important to realize that he doesn't just see this happening and immediately go and start overturning tables and yelling and pushing back. Like he, I don't know how long it takes to make a whip out of cords, but I know uh, he thought about what he was going to do long enough. It's a kind of a scary image. And, <laughs> and, and so. I think, I mean, you kind of get into this Nietzschean idea of God being sort of like this, this safety valve of the, the weak men trying to protect themselves from the strong, and so they invent this moral system that sort of governs everyone and protects everybody. And I think if you're an atheist, that's a valid thing to think, because... I know a lot of I know a lot of atheists who have a lot of potential to be really, really good men just on a, the level of their nature, but they don't have that supernatural thing to sort of drive them forward. I think the big contribution of Christianity to manliness understood in this way is it kind of raises the bar, it orients the common good towards something more more fulfilling. <clears throat> Before Christianity, the common good looks more like harmony within the family, the political regime, and that sort of thing. But once you have Christianity, the common good becomes something more along the lines of striving toward salvation. And that's an area where there's times to be aggressive in the pursuit of salvation and times to be charitable. Well, hopefully it's always charitable, but there's times to kind of achieve. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about the importance of brotherhood for manliness, um, because on the one hand, I think society kind of has a stereotype of the man being like a lone wolf, and yet at the same time, in some of your analogies, right, you said like there's the coach who actually has the power to throw in the towel, um, and I guess I've seen this in my own brothers and also just men in my life um that there is a lot of importance placed on fraternity and um just like what your thoughts are what is the contribution i guess of brotherhood to cultivating families i mean the first thing that comes to mind is you have to have somebody to punch <laughs> <laughs> i have my brothers to thank for that <laughs> But this kind of gets into the ground of role models, 
which is what I am how I initially wanted to go about trying to figure out what it means to be a good man and open up the role models in the formation of men. And unfortunately I didn't delve into that super deeply. But and and I didn't my my thesis was <coughs> theological, it's more I guess pragmatic and philosophical. But what comes to my mind immediately is this idea that JP2 talks about how in in the Greek account of Genesis, you have when God says it's not good for man to be alone, the word for man is just the word that means human. Mm -hmm. And the word for male isn't used until Eve is created, if it created, and then you have the contrast between male and female. So you don't really understand male without female. But and so for me, the implication of that is it's not good for a man to be alone. He's not saying it's not good for a male to be alone, therefore it means a female. It, it's not good for humans to be. I, I think that's the primary sense. But there's another sense in which it's not good for man to be alone in terms of just like part of the gift of Eve is well now man can have other men as companions. So his primary companion is Eve, but he's also surrounded by other men. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really know how to answer your question completely, but I guess can you contrast um yeah it's interesting that God gives Adam a woman, I, I suppose that, that makes sense, right? But like, what is the importance of brotherhood as opposed to sisterhood in actually cultivating manliness? I think I think the two things I would say is it's hard to learn how to be a man from a woman. <laughs> that is a good example of what a man looks like, and part of that. Part of that example, it doesn't have to be the perfect ideal because sometimes it's a little too hard to say. Sometimes it's on the level of peers where you both have faults, but you're both striving towards some sort of authentic sense of, of manliness. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's the most helpful way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. John? Yeah, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about boxing that. <laughs> I think it's a really good analogy. Um, I think you did a great job of showing how becoming good at boxing can help you become a better man, right? But actually, when I think of you know watching people box and recognizing which one the men are, right, it seems like being able to lose boxing well is also an important component of the game, man, right? And obviously, you have like it, you're gonna have to lose in boxing sometimes in order to, to get better at boxing. There, there's that component. But I guess I'm wondering if there is something about losing boxing well, simply being overpowered by a greater opponent, right? And, you know, taking that like a man, whatever that means, right? Can you speak to that a little bit? Like, is there something to what I'm saying, or is it just better to be as good as possible at boxing? Yeah, I, I think there's definitely, well, just like climbing the mountain, there's a sense of humility. With boxing, when you lose, you also have to have that sense of humility. And, and it's very helpful to realize, okay, I lost, what can I do to be better? And you also respect the other man for, for being good at what he does in the same way that you would want him to respect you for being good at what, what you do. And, and yeah, I think, I think it's a sign of maturity to be able to lose any sort of contest without, I mean, it's understandable to be mad, but if you're totally, if you lose a contest and you immediately turn to, well, he was cheating, like the other team did this, especially when, like, say, hypothetically, there's this, we'll call it a sport or activity that requires a great deal of aggression and only has, like, one or two rules, and, like, one team happens to lose, and then one more is just super angry because the other one cheated. <laughs> <laughs> there's only so many rules you can break. You didn't break any of those rules, so exactly how did the other team cheat? Like, it's a sort of a sign of immaturity if you, if you can't lose. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, my question is, uh, so Jordan Peterson, a psychologist and uh, one of the foremost speakers on masculinity, states that responsibility is the most primary thing for men to become men. Uh, my first question is, why would he make that statement? And uh, second, how does boxing teach responsibility? So within the framework that I delivered, I think the responsibility comes, it's a twofold responsibility. You have a responsibility towards yourself to act in accordance with nature so that you can fulfill your end. And then you have the responsibility towards others to not go overboard and be immoderate and sort of tread on other people in order to, under the guise of just, well, I'm just following nature. Like you have to be self-controlled. You're not, you're not an animal. You don't only act on instinct, but you can use these natural inclinations to suggest, okay, well, I'm starting to get angry. Maybe I'm perceiving something. Maybe there's something here that I'm supposed to do. But it doesn't mean, oh, I'm angry. I'm going to go punch somebody. Even though that can be fun, too, it's not as fun. <laughs> Would you prescribe boxing for every boy? Hmm. So if you have many boys, they're all very different. <clears throat> One of them just doesn't like it. Just seems to be very, like, does not interested at all, um, would you say, well, even more so because you have an aversion to it and then you need it more than your other brothers? Like, what, what would you say about that? I don't think it's a one size fits all, especially since there are other ways in which you can help to train people in this virtue. I think it also depends on why. If, if it's the case of your son has absolutely no sense of aggression, he can't stand up for himself, then I think it's your responsibility as a parent to make sure that somehow he develops aggression to some degree so that he has autonomy, he can assert himself, he's not just always bullied for the rest of his life. But I wouldn't want to say you need to force your children to box regardless because this is the only way that you can learn how to act. Uh, the news tells us that we should be very scared of violence and bad things happening, that it's happening everywhere. But if you look at the statistics, it's the safest time to be alive. There's the least amount of violence. Um, what would you tell the young boys uh, of this country that are being told to not embrace their masculinity and that they are in some senses secondhand citizens because I do see and I've had experience with um, young boys who are being told that they should not be embracing being a boy. I think it would come down to a particular case by case basis. Obviously, the way I would put it for one boy might look very different than how I would say to someone else. In general. But, yeah, generally, I think I would have to encourage them to... to look inside and... it partially comes down to conscience. Like, you don't want to, you don't want to conflate masculinity with just one trait, so say aggression, which is typically the trait under the microscope when people talk about violence. You don't want to say this is the only the only trait that you need to cultivate and control. There are a lot of others and so I guess you have to look at your nature you, and you have that's the other thing. Manliness, like this idea of being a good man can be very, very abstract. And so and that's where the role model fraternity thing comes in is okay look to a man in your life that you think is a good man and just pay attention to what he does and how he does it and try to start emulating that and hopefully they have someone in their life that they can look to hopefully they do yeah all right let's thank mr curly
features like all over the place. The news, everything is just like I saw it in the schools and everything. Just emasculate the boys. Yeah, that's you a good know? question. I expect the answer to be you have to have a sense of what men are just historically. Yeah. You have to look around now and find the models. And the boys. Uh, it's, aren't, it's a very different approach to what you were doing. It's not. Well, look at the thing that might be appealing. It's actually just example after example. It should be historical. It should be a film. I feel we're starting to start there. Yeah. So, 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 and, and if you were creating a kind of piece of art, the front of people is you probably want to be either yourself thinking clearly about a different thing. Nature taken broadly or history taken. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, they've got the examples I'm saying, I mean, they've got nobody. 